Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, uh, email me, uh, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Uh, before we do get started, I want to talk to you about Patreon. After much study and thought, we're going to experiment with a Patreon campaign for the great detectives of old time radio. With Patreon, rather than doing one-time uh, gifts through something like the listener support campaign, you can set up a recurring uh, donation to support the show every month. And you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot greatdetectives dot net in order to read the goals and to find out about supporting the campaign. Now, as we do roll this out, I want to assure you that we'll continue to accept one-time donations either through the website or through uh, the P.O. Box. I think that the Patreon uh, strategy really does have a potential to really improve the show. And we're going to talk about it over the next five days so it doesn't end up being too long of a conversation. So we've explained how it works and now we're going to talk about the first goal uh when we uh, get to 750 dollars in a monthly support we will upgrade our server the show is continuing to grow the good news is that most of the time the sh uh our current server can handle our load however we have moments, such as when we release some videos, that can slow it down. And other times, high usage. And so I want to proactively move to the next level in there. And that's our first goal. And that will come at the $750 level of total support. Of course, you can pledge uh, any amount from $2 and up. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, individual rewards after the show, but we've already been a bit long. So uh, let's go ahead and we'll get into today's episode of The Saint. The original air date is February the 25th of 1951. And I do want to assure you in advance, this isn't a Dragnet crossover, but the title is The Big Swindle. The Adventures of the Saint, starring Vincent Price. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes transcribed to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Vincent Price as... The Saint. Just a moment. Yes? Are you Simon Templer? The man they call the Saint? Yes, I am. Who am I? Oh, what do I get if I come up with the correct answer? Let me in and I'll show you. Well, you're in. If you're carrying your laundry in that little black bag, Jack Benny is... I in. said I'll show you. There. Oh. Laundry never looked like this. Don't touch, just look. It's almost all big bills. A whole bag full of big bills. What did you do, sell your car to Honest John? That's what I want you to tell me. You mean you don't know how you got all this money? I don't know anything. That goes for who I am, where I came from, where I'm going. I see. An hour ago, I woke up in the taxi and was driving through the park. I got a bump on the head the size of an ostrich egg and this bag full of sugar beside me. When I wake up from a bump on the head, I'm lucky if I find an aspirin beside me. I got no wallet, no papers, no keys, not even a matchbook. My pockets are empty and so's my head. I remember nothing. The cab driver? Oh, he's waiting for me downstairs. He says he picked me up on a midtown street. He says I gave him a ten spot to drive me through the park while I took a nap. So for a thousand dollars from this joy-jammed bag, Saint, who am I? My friend, I'm afraid you have amnesia. You'd better tear some doctor away from his cigarette test and have yourself looked at. You're nuts. 
You go to a doctor with a knock on your noggin, the doctor calls the cops, the cops come calling, and write your own finish. You don't like cops? With a hat like I'm wearing, I'm not even positive I hate spinach. It isn't what I might think of cops that's important, Saint. It's what they might think of me. You mean the money? I mean exactly nothing else. Anybody carrying this kind of dough these days has either been stealing from a bank or holding on to government. No hospital, Saint. No doctors, no cops, no explanations, no jails. You. Me. You. Once again, Saint, for a thousand bucks, who am I? All right. A thousand dollars goes to the Red Cross in anticipation of the day that I become a... National disaster. You just made a deal. And as for you, you'd better go into my guest room, lock yourself and your money in, and sleep off that bump, huh? Before it grows into another head and wants to know who it is. You'll find sleeping pills in the medicine chest if you need them. I'll need them. You're going somewhere? I want to see if that cab driver left his meter running. Thanks a lot, Mr. Templer. You're very welcome, Mr. I can't help you there. But for the time being, I'll just call you... Mr. Sugar. Mister, all I know is the guy climbs in the cab at 48 in Madison, hands me a 10 spot, tells me to take it off through the park while he snatches 40. He handed you the money before you took him riding? Yeah, before. Well, let me have how come. Because I didn't want him in my cab, that's how come. The way he was bobbing and weaving, I thought he was lushed. I didn't want no trouble with no drunks. So you had a little argument? A little discussion. Then he takes out a $10 bill and forces it on me. So I stop discussing and start driving. The $10 bill, he took it out of his pocket, huh? If you know any other place a guy can carry his dough, let me know and I'll take the bill off of my wife's neck when we go to bed nights. Hmm. Out of his pocket. What's the matter? You think I'm lying? You're not lying. Now I know how my old grandmother felt when the medicine man swore that the snake oil would cure her rheumatism. Well, having trouble finding out what the score is, huh? I don't care what the score is. I'd just like to know what the game is. Well, well, here he is, your long last, Basil. Yeah, and I'm very glad, Cecil. Oh, so glad. You were waiting for me. Yeah, we seen you chatting with the cab pusher outside, Saint. We didn't want to interrupt. So we come here into the hall. To await you. We want to have a chat, too. With you, Saint. With you. Oh, please, now, one head at a time. Now, what should we chat about? A man. Which man? The man we've been shagging. Shagging? He means following. The guy's in your apartment now. When we phone the boss and tell him, the boss has a reaction. Right while he's talking to us. I can understand it. I feel a little sick myself. Uh, the boss says we should collar you and ask you politely. No, Basil. He said first ask him politely. Oh, thank you, Cecil. So we are asking, sir. Politely? So why don't you politely tell us? Look, if you boys are auditioning a new television act, Radio City went that away. We almost do a lot of politely, Saint. We hardly got one good man left. So what goes with the man in your apartment, Saint? The boss says he wants to know. The boss says he got to know. The boss says he don't want that old trouble with the law should start up again. Basil, you're talking too much. I apologize, And sir. Saint, you are not talking enough. Now, politely, for the final time, the man with the black bag... What's he up to? Yeah, and what's he carrying in a bag? Mustache wax. Mustache wax? Yes, a new kind of mustache wax, homogenized. He dropped in to give me a free home demonstration. Oh, don't give us none of that. You ain't even got a mustache. Well, he said he didn't mind waiting. Oh, dear. Basil, shall you hold him while I hit him, or shall I hold him while you hit him? No, you make the choice. No, no, Basil, I insist. Oh, oh, you are you high, what? Hello, boss. Hello, Saint. Hey, you're just in time to accept my thank you. You thanking me? Yeah, for making me a member of the Thug of the Month Club. Just think of all the money I've been wasting on gymnasiums. From where I sat, it didn't look wasted. Huh. Go on, beat it, boys. I'll talk to you later. I don't be saw, boss. We try to be polite, then we see some. We ain't that. Yeah, yeah, beat it, beat it. Yeah. You know me, Templar? Yeah, not as well as I would if I bet on horse races. Frank O'Connor, you're a bookmaker. Well, you don't know me at all, Saint. I'm not a bookmaker. I'm the bookmaker. Mm, bully for you. We'll get right to the heart of the thing, eh? 
How much? I've got nothing for sale. Try Macy's. Ah, let's be a little realistic, Templar. The way you live, the way you dress, you know, you get that dollar look. All that you've got to do is tell me in 50 words or less what I want to know about your guest inside and the big cash prize is yours. What's he up to? Mm, He doesn't know either, he says. Oh, come on, fella. Give a little. Do I have to start mentioning amounts? You can mention any amounts of amounts you want. I've nothing to sell you, O'Connor. All right, okay, if that's the way you want to play the hand. But you won't hold out long. I've found that people and racehorses have one important thing in common. They both have a price. And then why bother me with your impossible questions? Go make a deal with citation. Now, the deal will be with you, Saint. And if my money won't make the record spin, the boys have a way all their own. Mm, yes, the boys. It's too bad they weren't able to stick around and play a little longer. But I guess the zoo was getting anxious. Oh, you'll be seeing them again. Soon. And Saint... Maybe you better start getting anxious. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, love, which thou and I with fate conspire to change this sorry scheme of things entire. Would we not shatter it to bits and then... Anyone who recites Omar Khayyam to a highball either loves Omar Khayyam or loves highball. (laughs) I'm happy to say that I love and am faithful to both. And what brings the great saint, the scourge of the wicked, the nemesis of evil, to this humble drinking place? I have a brain to pick with you, Murphy. Whose brain? Your brain. Ah, you've made a wise choice. (laughs) Do we haggle about price, or is it the usual? The price is what it always is. Splendid, splendid. I will accept payment now. <laughs> hey, bartender. Yeah? A bottle of bourbon for my friend. One of the stamped for services rendered. Coming right up. Ah. Here you are. Yeah, thank you. And now, uh, render friend. At your service, friend. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. Now, which branch of my fabulous brain have you purchased? Memory branch, Mice and Men Division, Department of Thugs and Bookmakers, the file on Frank O'Connor. Mm-hmm. Frank O'Connor, born in Boston in 1912, father was... Yeah, a... which brings us up to recent years and an old trouble with the law that he doesn't want should start up again, to quote a thug named Basil. In the case of the missing paint man, Payne. Huh? Well, let's have that in Walt's time. George Payne, Payne's Paints. He liked to play the horses. He didn't like to pay the bookmaker. He didn't mind making promises, though. When was this? Oh, a couple of years ago. He owed O'Connor what could easily have been the annual budget of a small Latin American republic. How did it all come out? He disappeared. Disappeared? Like the buttons on a shirt in a ten-cent laundry. It created quite a splash. Sure. How come you, I didn't... You were in Las Vegas at the time. The Hotel Flamingo, I believe. It was room uh, 210, and the lady you liked from the floor show was named Yvonne. Yeah, someday when you have time, would you mind writing my memoir? But right now, let's go on with the opera. Yeah. The police found out about Payne's debt to O'Connor. They picked O'Connor up, grilled him, medium rare, made him very uncomfortable, found they couldn't pin anything on him, turned him loose. Yeah, and Payne? Where are the snows of yesteryear? The popular theory is that he is a victim of amnesia somewhere. Amnesia? He's had it twice before, his doctor said. So be kind to the next bum who asks for a handout, Simon. He may own a million-dollar paint factory in Long Island City. Any relatives? Wife. Much younger. Much prettier, too, they tell me. She's running the paint factory now, bigger and better than ever. That's all. Close file. And I got my money's worth. Naturally. I do have a remarkable brain, don't I? Fabulous. Any time, Mr. Templer, any time. I am here at my office every day. (laughs) Excuse me. You're excused, but with reluctance. I'd like to get by, please. Yeah, you'd get by anywhere. 
Look, I'm a very busy woman. I have no intention of standing here on a catwalk suspended over a thousand-gallon vat of boiling resin while a stranger throws passes at me. Mm, so that's what's boiling in that outsized tub below us, huh? Resin. <laughs> and I had hopes it would turn out to be a hot Tom and Jerry. See here, who are you? What are you doing here? Well, they told me in the front office that Mrs. Payne would be back here in the production office. I'm uh, Simon Templer. I'm Mrs. Payne. And if you want to talk to me, Mr. Templer... Let's get away from the heat of that vat before my makeup runs. Well, if it runs, I'll chase it for you. Come into my office. Oh, thank you. Ms. Payne, I'm, uh, I'm here to talk to you about your husband. My husband? Mm. You know something about George. You know where he is. Well, let's just say I know where a man with amnesia is. At least he says he has amnesia. He s- says? I'm afraid I don't understand. Well, frankly, neither do I yet. Then what makes you think you... Well, a bookmaker named Frank O'Connor. O'Connor? Yeah, and two patrons of the arts named Basil and Cecil who work for him. I'm afraid I don't follow you. In the course of a dull conversation, Basil let it slip that their interest in my man with a paralyzed memory is a continuation of their one-time interest in your husband. So you think that the man with amnesia and my husband are one and the same? Mm, that's the theory that I'm working on. Well, if only it turns out to be more than a theory. Uh, Mr. Templer, when can I meet this man? We'll get your hat. Now? All right. Only... Uh... Look, if you're worried about that resin you have cooking, couldn't you get some obliging neighbor to turn it off when it's done? <laughs> my only obliging neighbor is the foreman of this plant. I can leave as soon as he comes back. Fine. Here's my card. Thank you. Oh, if only I could have George back again. Mr. Templer, if the man with the bump on his head does turn out to be my husband, I shall be eternally in your debt. That idea has some fascinating connotations. And if I say yes? Joe Fowler, Interurban Insurance Company. Oh, I don't need any. Oh, I'm not a salesman. I'm an investigator. Of what? Well, people, mostly. I hear you've dug up a guy who might be George Payne. He has big ears. I have a big telephone. Mrs. Payne called me right after you left her. I'd like to have a talk with this guy who might be George Payne. Now, come on in, Fowler. If there's anything left of the guy, when I get through with him, it's yours. You don't sound happy about this character. No, and I won't be until I know why he's pretending to have amnesia. Pretending? Yeah. Uh, why is the insurance company dipping an oar into this? Quarter of a million bucks. Good reason. Mm-hmm. 250,000 good reasons. That's the amount you won't have to pay if Mr. Payne is still living, huh? That's it. Yeah, well, come and meet my guest. Yeah, I'd like to very much. Mr. Sugar. Hmm. He didn't lock Templar. Look, hanging from the... Oh. Well, he, he committed suicide. Yeah, it looks that way. It was supposed to look that way. But if he could talk, I think he'd tell us he'd been murdered. <laughs> Cheerful place, isn't it, Fowler? Waiting rooms of morgues aren't supposed to be cheerful. You're pretty sure that the unfortunate victim is Payne, aren't you? Oh, I didn't say that, Saint. I said he fits the physical description. But if the lovely Mrs. Payne should tell us that she is satisfied with the identification that the corpse is her husband, then what? Well, then in all likelihood, the insurance company will be equally satisfied. And $250,000 moves from your pocket to hers. That's the way it goes, Saint. Mm. When a policyholder dies, we pay. It's the basic principle of life insurance, you know. I know. But in this particular instance, a few things strike me as being a little too basic. What do you mean? And I can answer that partially as of now, but I prefer to answer it entirely as of later. You still think Payne was murdered, Saint? Thoroughly. Guesswork? Mathematics. The well-worn problem of two added to two and equaling four, only in this case it was ten and ten equaling twenty. Twenty what? Sleeping pills. 
Sleeping pills? Yeah, Twenty sleeping pills, each one guaranteed by the manufacturer to make you dream of Hedy Lamar. They, um, they're in my medicine chest. Oh, today I'm stupid. The late lamented knew I had dream pills in my medicine chest. He even said he thought he would need one. So he took one, and it didn't work. And he lay awake with a bump in the head and a skull full of amnesia, and being mentally upset, he became depressed, and he got out of bed and hung himself. Fowler, have you ever hung yourself? You... Huh? It's a difficult thing to do. And it's a dreary way to die. Painful, too. You can swing and sway in agony for as much as five minutes before you pronounce yourself dead. Well, but people have been known to do it, Saint. Not people who have 20 sleeping pills available. Yeah, I see what you mean. If he'd wanted to kill himself, he'd have gone after the pills instead of the court. Say, you are a detective. Well, but why was he murdered? Well, some people call it the root of all evil. You and I simply refer to it as money. This is where I get off. If he was knocked off for anything, it was certainly not for money. Or didn't you notice that little black bag was still with him? If the killer had taken the little black bag with its little green contents, the suicide he hoped to make everyone think it was would no longer look like suicide. There's a lot of sugar in that bag, Saint. And the killer could have so easily taken it. it. Cost him a lot of money to make this murder look like suicide. The way I'm thinking, it didn't cost him one red cent. What do you mean? Not one Chinese dime. Because that little black bag with its cargo of joy, every last penny of it, will now go back to its lawful owner. Lawful owner? But who? The killer. I don't think I'll wait any longer for Mrs. Payne to come and identify the body. I have a sudden urge to talk to a certain bookmaker. You're going? You're not interested in knowing whether or not Mrs. Payne identifies the guy as her husband? Mr. Fowler. Are you kidding? <laughs> A taxi! Taxi! You don't want a taxi, Mr. Templer. Does he, Basil? No, indeed, he don't, Cecil. You have used your head. Mm, he's used both his heads. Is it recess time at the monkey house again, boys? He is funny. Is he, Basil? He is funny now, Cecil, but will he be funny later? No, he will not, Basil. It is not possible to be funny when you are sleeping under riverbed in a pair of cement pajamas. I want you knights of the round table to take me somewhere. Hmm? Oh, we're going to take you somewhere, all right. Yeah, I want to see O'Connor. There are some questions I intend to make him answer. You are going to make him? Yeah. Basil, either this chap is screwy or somebody already beat his brains up. I'm saying... The boss is awaiting in the car. Well, I hope he hasn't been awaiting too long. Uh, this way, Pigeon. And, Saint, we are just about on a voyage of losing our politeness, are we not, Cecil? We indeed are. What my colleague means, Saint, is don't venture to try nothing. Yes, Saint, like I told you, people and racehorses, they both have a price. You wouldn't talk for money, so the price is now a painless rub-out as against one that's full of agony. Hey, you're being far too generous, O'Connor. Hey, drive carefully, you hooligan. You want the cops on us? I'm sorry, boss. Don't worry, boss. I will see the Basil drives carefully. Yeah, yeah. Well, Saint... Look, I'll make the offer even more attractive. I'll let you choose the spot where the bullets go. Oh, really? Now, that's too much. Frankly, Saint, I'd like to be able to tell you that I'll let you go after you told me what I want. You know, maybe with just a couple of broken bones here and there, some little nothing. stuff. Yeah. But I can't do it. I can't let you continue alive. You're too smart. And unless you're running way off form, you've stirred up a fire I thought I'd put out three years ago. You did kill Payne the paint man three years ago, didn't you? Well, he owed me some pretty important money. The boys and I called on him to collect, and he said no. And the boys went into action. I'll say we did. Yeah, these two apes of mine, they made with a little too much action. See, I didn't want George Payne killed... Just wanted him scared into paying up. Mm, but Payne died, and the river bottom has been his home these last three years. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's it. And tonight, he's going to have company on that lonely river bottom. And it won't be no mermaid. <laughs> ready to give me an earful now, Saint? Not quite ready. 
We'll make them ready when we get to the shack, boys. Yeah, I'll be just screaming to talk. Meanwhile, then, let's have some more of your reminiscences, O'Connor. For instance, uh, what made you so interested in the little man with the black bag, huh? What made me interested? Hey, you crazy? <laughs> Here we go, we knock a guy off three years ago, and for three years, he's laying in a river. Hey, how would you feel if you see him or his exact duplicate, the same clothes, same everything... On the street one day last week. I'd feel haunted. So you had the boys tail him for a couple of days. Yeah. And one of the places he went was my apartment. Yeah, yeah. But where he goes twice before that, that's what I get to worry over. Ah, yeah. He went to the place where George Payne would be most apt to go, didn't he? Yeah, he sure did. So you began to worry about it, huh? You didn't want George Payne or anything concerning him to pop up anywhere. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You worried because... Whatever Payne's double was up to had to be a swindle. And you were afraid that the swindle might interest the police again in the Payne affair. And that you'd be on the carpet again and maybe this time you'd be nailed as Payne's killer. Yeah, I knew that you had it figured, Saint. (laughs) You see what brains do for a guy, though? You are going to be killed because you got brains. Ah, Sam. Come on, Saint. Come on, give, huh? Give. Spare the boys some bruised knuckles. What's the swindle the guy who looks like Payne is pulling? Yeah, well, if he's pulling us any swindle right now, it's trying to convince St. Peter that he belongs. Huh? Yeah, the man you're worried about is dead. Dead? Now you're pulling a swindle. Well, a little sightseeing trip to the morgue will convince you. Okay. All right, we'll take that trip, Saint. And if the guy is dead like you say, maybe you'll live a little. But if he's not... You're going to be dead a little. Well, I'm glad you're still here. I see everyone else is gone. Oh, I dread the thought of going home. After seeing my poor husband in the morgue, I I thought maybe if I could work, I'd not think too much. What do I do now, applaud? Pardon? The performance, the speech you just gave. Mrs. Payne, frankly speaking, you're just about as bad an actress as you are a swindler. Why, how dare you? Look, are you going to climb down off that high dudgeon, or must I push you? Your little plot was a honey. It was so simple, it almost worked. Look here, I demand to know what... Such a simple swindle, almost stupid. We have a Mr. Payne who has been missing for three years. We have a Mrs. Payne who is dying to get her hot little hands on a quarter of a million dollars worth of insurance money. Oh, you're insane. And finally, we have the highly fortuitous appearance of a man who looks so much like the missing Mr. Payne that even his bookie gives him a double take. Plot? Make a deal with the double. Have him fake amnesia. Tell him to call on the saint and ask the saint to find out who he is. I don't know what you're talking about. Give the man a prop, a bag of money, so that the man can say, I wouldn't be bothering you, saint. I'd go to the police and ask them to find out who I am, except that this money I've got is probably illegal. So the saint puts his fabulous nose to the grindstone and sniffs out that the man is George Payne. And the man, of course, willingly allows himself to be murdered. So that I can collect my husband's insurance. The man thought he would take over a paint factory. That's all he thought. He didn't know about insurance. So, the man is then murdered. By me, of course. No, no. You and I were here together, remember? We were standing over that hot vat of resin at the time the man was murdered. Well, thank you at least for not accusing me of murder, Mr. Templer. I said you didn't actually commit the murder, but your colleague did. So you are just as much of a candidate for the chair as he is. Oh, I have a colleague, have I? With an imagination like yours, Mr. Temper, I'm surprised you didn't make it a whole game. Mm, so the man is murdered and Mrs. Payne says, yep, that's, that's George Payne and collects all the insurance money as of now without having to wait that long, dreary seven years before her missing spouse can be declared legally dead. End plot. <laughs> you should write comic books, Mr. Templer. Yeah, I should. At least the murderers in that business are all made of ink. You know, this whole affair might have given me great difficulty if it weren't for one thing. Oh, what one thing? Mm, a stupid thing. The man with the alleged amnesia telling me he awoke from his deep nap with his pockets picked dry. And yet the cab driver telling me that he took a $10 bill out of his pocket. A little unimportant and stupid. Of course, you can prove all the wild things you've been saying. There's only one thing that still consumes my curiosity, Mrs. Payne. Who is your accomplice, the man who actually committed the murder? Well, all you have to do, Mr. Templer, 
Just turn around and you'll see him. And you'll see this beautiful gun I'm holding, too. Oh, uh, yes, an insurance company detective would be a big help in swindling an insurance company. Stay where you are, Saint. I said stay where you are. Give me that gun. Give it to me. Thank you. Run it, run. That won't help, Mrs. Payne. Someday, somebody is going to buy a can of your paint, Mrs. Payne, and wonder why there are buttons in it. Don't bother, Mrs. Payne. I've been called it before. What do you say we go drop in on some policemen, huh? been listening to another transcribed adventure of The Saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. Now here is our star, Vincent Price. Ladies and gentlemen, in tonight's cast, you heard Joan Banks as Mrs. Payne and Sheldon Leonard as Frank. Ed Max and Tony Barrett were Cecil and Basil. Sidney Miller was Murphy, Lamont Johnson, Mr. Sugar, and Jack Moyles Fowler. This is Vincent Price inviting you to join us again next week at this same time for another exciting adventure of The Saint. Good night. <laughs> This adventure of The Saint was written by Michael Cramoy. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, is a James L. Safier production and is directed by Helen Mack. Vincent Price is soon to be seen co-starring with Michelin Prell and Errol Flynn in Marsh, uh, William Marshall's production of Bloodline. All you Saint fans will be glad to know the Saint comic books are available on all newsstands. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Next Sunday, you're invited to the Theater Guild on the Air's full hour and a half production of Shakespeare's masterpiece, Hamlet. The pages of Hamlet come to life on Theater Guild next Sunday, March 4th on NBC. This is Andrew J. Graham, author of the Web Surface series. Oh, and a madam's wife. You're listening to the great detectives of old time radio. This was a, a great episode, if for no reason, then this probably featured, you could, you could call the lineup of Sheldon Leonard, Tony Barrett, and Ed Mack an all-star thug lineup. Seriously, if you were looking for three uh, radio actors to play members of a criminal gang, that's about as good as it gets. And once again, uh, just some fine detective work from... Uh, Simon Templar. And these episodes are just so well written and so well developed as uh, mysteries. So I thoroughly enjoyed it. Well now, time for the individual reward levels for Patreon. And I had some fun with some uh, creative uh, naming. I guess tying them into detectives. Our basic level, our basic level, the $2 a month level, is the rookie level. And that just comes with a thank you on the show. The $4 level is the Seamus level, which gives you lifetime access to our premium site for the life of the show. Our, our next level is Detective Sergeant, and it is at the $7.14 uh, level. And fans of Dragnet will know why that particular uh, donation amount for the Detective Sergeant reward. Uh, with that, uh, you get access to the premium site. You also get early episode access to all of a given week's programs. So if you'd like to listen to the show and email me your comments on the episode before it actually airs, you can get your comments in at the same time mine are. You also get your choice of one of my ebooks every uh, six months. And we'll talk more about the other levels uh, tomorrow. Now we turn to listener comments and feedback. And this one uh, comes from uh, Jared, who said, My name is Jared, and I'm 14, but I just love your show. It's my favorite podcast of all time. I love your comments about the episode. 
Uh, you point out things I'd missed, and I love that. Well, thanks so much, Jared. I really do appreciate that. And thanks for listening. Glad you're enjoying old-time radio, and uh, again, thanks so much. All right, well, that will do it for today. Tomorrow, we'll be back with an episode of Ellery Queen. And uh, next Monday, Vincent Price and the Saint. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. Become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio 